Hello and welcome. While we've heard it time and time again about the importance of strengthening our pelvic floor muscles, but it's not until you have a sudden or unexpected loss of bladder control when you cough, laugh, jump or sneeze that you experience firsthand the importance of strengthening your pelvic floor muscles. You know, to ensure that we don't have to make any lifestyle changes or sacrifices to accommodate for embarrassing leakages, we really can't afford to leave this issue untreated. So to help talk to us about pelvic floor and its importance during and after childbirth, we welcome our special guest, Linda Fuller, Clinical Director at Davlin Health. Now, as mentioned, Linda is the Director at Davlin Health, and they're based in Melbourne, which she set up following her own challenges with pelvic floor dysfunction and not being happy with the options given to her by her GP, such as surgery, uh, medication or lifetime physio. She sought out a non-invasive solution for bladder leakage and weak pelvic floor. Now, she now treats many women and men for bladder leakage incontinence uh, with the BTL M Cellar Chair and is delighted to be able to educate both women and men, men to give them both their freedom and their dignity. Thank you so much for joining us today. How are you? Yeah, good, thank you. And it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you for inviting me. Yes, this is wonderful. Now, on this subject, I uh, just wanted to speak some, some stats to begin with. Pelvic floor dysfunction really is a taboo condition and subject that is rarely talked about, yet the, the percentages of, of 4 to 8% of the human population actually suffer um, with uh, incontinence overall. So I just wanted to speak just broadly about this, this topic and why you think it, it is such a taboo topic that people just don't want to talk about. <laughs> Absolutely. So the Continents Foundation of Australia, their stats would be that over 5 million Australians, that's one in four people, experience some form of incontinence. That's better about uh, control problems. Mm -hmm. So 80% of people with urinary incontinence or bladder leakage are generally women. It's 80% of women. Uh, one in three women who've uh, ever had a baby with themselves and less than two out of 10 women do their pelvic floor exercises daily. So um, the really um, frightening stat too is that 70% of incontinent people do not seek help. So the majority of people would say it is normal, normal but the truth is it is very common, it is not normal. Mm. And people should look to address this. Okay. Well, there's lots to talk about on this topic, but before we sort of get stuck into all of the, the details, wanted to acknowledge, we published your article and the title is The Pelvic Floor and Its Importance to Our Body During and After Childbirth, uh, which of course this article is now featured in our newborn guide that we had published yesterday as well. Um, so for someone who hasn't read the article yet, can you please tell us what the article is about and of course, what inspired you to write it? Right, so Rachel, um, when um, a mother has just given birth, she leaves the hospital and she has this beautiful baby and it's all about the baby and there's often very little about the woman or the mother herself. And as you know, her body goes through so many different changes and challenges that um, it is very hard to get your head around what happens to your body. And... Um, as most women will attest, most mothers will attest that, you know, you just feel like the bottom has fallen out of your vagina because you think about it, if you have given birth naturally, um, your vagina or the birth canal has actually increased to the size of the baby's head, stretched that much in order to accommodate the birth. Of so course. It, it does take some time for, the ba for your body to then recover. Um, you know, having gone through that trauma. And then, of course, the, you have the added trauma in some cases, in many cases, where women are um, actually tear. And then they have the episiotomy, which is actually the sewing up to mm -hmm. repair the tear. So as much as you have this beautiful baby and you're very happy and it's a really good time in your life, it's a lot to take in when your body is not um, reacting the way it normally did. And one of the major issues that women will have postpartum after giving birth is that they will leak. And it's quite a frightening thing. Um, so the big thing is for women to be aware of it, to be educated, 
and to, in some cases, if they're able to, is to prepare for it and start to do some sort of exercise routine, et cetera, pelvic floor exercises or, uh, you know, Kegels, just so that they can then give themselves the absolute best chance to ensure that um, they're in good shape postpartum. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, just wanted to establish initially, just in case anyone watching and listening um, isn't necessarily um, sure where the pelvic mu muscles are located, could you just explain just briefly where are the pelvic floor muscles lo located and what are their function? Just, just to establish okay. at the get-go. <laughs> Right. So your pelvic floor muscles are extremely important muscles. Now, because we can't see them, mm. we often don't think about them. We may go to the gym and we exercise our glutes and our core and our triceps and biceps because we can see them and they look good. But having pelvic floor muscles, they are not obviously visible. And so we forget about them. And they are so important because they do connect the pubic bone to the tailbone and from the left hip to the right hip. So in fact, they're, they're actually a hammock whereupon all the organs fit. So you have your um, bladder, your bowel, your uterus on top of your pelvic floor. And then when you're pregnant and you carry your baby for nine months, you have the weight of the fetus on top of that. So you can imagine just the gravity um, pushing down with all those organs. And then, of course, the fetus, you know, it will then lead to a certain amount of laxity um, with gravity. Um, and so it's really important that you are in good shape prior to your pregnancy. Okay, so there are a band of muscles that stretch across the bottom of our abdomen from our tailbone to our pubic bone, um, and which our pelvic organs, as you mentioned, the bladder, the bowel, and the uterus actually rest on. So the pelvic floor muscles act like a basket and a hammock, as you said, to support these pelvic organs against gravity and increase uh, all the abdominal sort of pressure as well was that what it is would you say correct yeah that's exactly it so so you know if you think of of the anatomy um there is no bone you know if you, you think of the pelvic um the, the skeleton and um, so your um pelvic floor is really between you uh, your organs and really fresh air because that's really what what happens so uh, with the gravity it could really um you know pull down with the weight of, of all of those organs. Mm -hmm. So how can pregnancy affect our pelvic floor then? Right, so um, with, um, obviously during pregnancy, you, your body goes through a lot of changes and um, your, uh, the lady's tummy has to then accommodate the growth of the fetus. So all the organs are then being pushed down to accommodate as the baby grows. Mm. And so then there's obviously even more pressure onto the pelvic floor. And um, as all mothers will, who've ever carried babies will attest that the, um, there's a lot of pressure on your bladder as well. And so they do then experience some form of leakage with regards to the fetus growing inside them and not that much space. So there's, there's, um, you know, a lot of um, force and pressure coming down onto to the bladder as well. And that, of course, then does cause a little leakage during pregnancy. Mm. So pregnancy and childbirth undoubtedly then can have a lasting effect on your pelvic floor muscle fitness, it seems like. And, and being pregnant, um, that obviously supports the weight, as you mentioned before, of the uterus during pregnancy and giving birth uh, stretches the muscles of the pelvic floor. Is it dif more, more difficult to do pelvic floor um, sort of exercises whilst you are expecting in general? Is, is that sort of harder? So Rachel, that's a good question. It really would be ideal if the mother-to-be could do the exercises pre-birth, obviously, and, and pre-pregnancy so that the pelvic floor is in really good shape. And then during pregnancy, they would know then know how to do uh, pelvic floor um, contractions and exercises and would then be, um, have their pelvic floor in a far better um, condition um, during pregnancy, and it would, of course, help them mm -hmm. also in giving birth. 
Okay, so it's where, where possible, if a couple are planning for the woman to start those pelvic floor exercises and strengthening of, a, of that muscle, uh, sort of pre-pregnancy, if at all possible. Um, but I understand that some women are, are at more risk of pelvic floor problems during pregnancy and childbirth than others. Um, and these include women who have had multiple births, um, large babies over four kilos, you know, long labor, where they've used also um, sort of birth instruments using forceps and those types of things and also um, second stage of labor so where it's been over one hour and those types of things as well also where a woman has had stitches or a tear um, or tearing as well so I just wanted to know your thoughts on that yeah so uh, Rachel all those things you've mentioned are things which would exacerbate um, you know pelvic floor uh, dysfunction and leakage thereafter. So a lot of people say to me, how can I prevent um, leakage once I'm, I'm postpartum? And it's very difficult to tell because it all depends on your, your genes. You know, what did your mother go through? How did, you know, what happened to her? Um, the other thing too is the weight, the size of your baby, how long you're in labor, how long you push, et cetera, et cetera, whether you tear or not. So um, very difficult to, to tell straight up how you're going to react and what condition your pelvic floor will be in postpartum. So the good thing about this is that you can be proactive and you can do exercises to get your pelvic floor into um, good shape prior to um, giving birth. Mm -hmm. So with that, I mean, how often should a woman, if she's expecting, um, be sort of exercising her pelvic floor during pregnancy then? So, Rachel, it will also depend on how um, far she is into her pregnancy mm -hmm. and what condition her pelvic floor was in prior to, to falling pregnant. And if she is um, um, familiar with uh, pelvic floor exercises or Kegels, as we also call them, um, and she, she knows how to do them, you know, it all just depends on that. So, really, the thing is to, to be educated. And prior to birth, try and make sure that, that, that you, you have some understanding of your pelvic floor and that you, you've given yourself absolutely the best opportunity to um, make sure that your pelvic floor is in good um, situation post-birth. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, does a woman escape pelvic floor issues if she has a cesarean birth? What are your thoughts? That's a very good question because when we, we treat our patients in the clinic, we always um, ask them whether they had a natural birth or a C-section. And most of the women say to me, I have a, had a C-section, I should not be leaking. And yet, um, as we've discussed earlier, a C-section does not um, preclude you from any bladder leakage. What does happen is that you're still carrying your baby for nine months. You still have the weight of the bladder, the bowel and the... Um, um, uterus on top of your pelvic floor so gravity does play a part as well we also see a lot of women in certain sort of industries like teachers and uh, nurses who are on their feet a lot we also find carers and caregivers who are working with um, patients and are doing physical work we find that they they generally do um, show quite uh, um, a lot of leakage as well um, post birth too because um, of the physical nature of the kind of work that they have, you know, and also being on their feet a lot too does um, make them just more vulnerable for that sort of thing. So yes, a C-section does not <laughs> give you um, carte blanche. It will not, um, you would still probably experience some sort of leakage. As well. Now, in the article, you also sh share some great um, stats, and I'd love to just talk through some of them now as well. The first one you mentioned is up to 75% of women suffer from urinary incontinence during pregnancy. 75%, that's, that's a huge number. It's very, very common then, obviously. Absolutely. Very, very common. And as we spoke about earlier, so the, the, um, the baby is growing inside you and there's not much room for the other organs. And of course, the weight is on the, the bladder. And of course, there is um, the, the chance that, that you will leak. And um, also, um, the thing too, when you're pregnant is you don't have quite as much control. You have more weight. Um, so, you know, um, you, you're tired. You know, your muscles could be a little bit more tired. So um, there are many reasons why women would, would leak during pregnancy. And it is extremely common. In fact, I would say... Uh, 
um, very, very few women go through their nine months of pregnancy without leaking at some stage. Interesting. 75% is a really high stat. That's incredible. Now, the, the, the next um, stat you have in the article is that 45% of mothers still have urinary incontinence seven years postnatally. So this is something that just doesn't just, you know, start and stop around sort of just that, that pregnancy sort of period and the newborn period, etc. This sort of can, can go on for up to seven years, if not longer. That's incredible. And that's 45% of mothers. Once again, they're really, really high stats, don't you think? Yes, very, very high. But um, the whole thing about um, bladder leakage or urinary incontinence, as it's technically called, is that um, it is extremely common, um, but it is not normal. Mm -hmm. And so it really needs to be addressed. But um, I think possibly during um, just post um, birth, a lot of women are going, their bodies are going through so much and mm. their body's trying to recover. The pelvic floor muscles are trying to get back into shape. And so women always experience that leakage. But then um, thereafter, there comes a time when some of the pelvic floors are able to recover and you'll find that that women are fine. But a lot of people, as we said, 45% of women still have leakage seven years after giving birth, mm. which you know, left unaddressed uh, will cause them problems later on. And I mean, they should possibly just look at their mothers and their grandmothers and, and have a discussion with them, given that weak pelvic floor is generally genetic. And so if their mother suffers from uh, incontinence or their grandmother is wearing pads, you know, to all day, they need to really consider um, this fact and, and think about how they can uh, look after their body so that they are not like their grandmothers when they get to 60, 70 years old. Mm -hmm. And the other stat I wanted to mention also that you, you highlight in the article, that 75% of women, again, um, who reported um, urinary incontinence three months after birth were still incontinent 12 years later. So this is something that, uh, this is a muscle that we can strengthen. This is something that can be fixed. So it's the, the, there really should be no other reason that we should still be suffering with something like this 12 years after the birth of a baby, don't you think? Well, absolutely, because, um, Rachel, it's debilitating. I see so many women in my clinic who um, plan their day around toilet locations or plan their shopping around toilet facilities. I've had a lady in the clinic, too, who um, had grandchildren in Geelong, which is about maybe an hour's drive from Melbourne, mm -hmm. and she would not go and visit the grandchildren because she couldn't find a um, toilet stop on the way that she felt was up to her standard so she would not travel because she couldn't um stop to you know go to to the, to the toilet and um, and we see so many women who have very very similar um tales to tell you know some women won't go for a haircut because they cannot sit still in a chair for two hours you know under the lights or whatever it is um we have women who won't go to the movies they can't sit through they can't sit still for you know two, three hours, and they just don't go to the movies. Mm -hmm. And this, this is all because um, we don't talk about it. It's very much a taboo subject. And in fact, a lot of the women I talk to, I say, then, have you spoken to your girlfriends about this? Because I can guarantee you that at least 60% of your girlfriends are going through exactly the same thing. And they say, no, I'm sure they're not because we don't talk about it. And this is... Um, my passion is to make people talk about it more so that it is um, we educate everybody so that they know what can happen and that they know it's not uh, normal and that they can address it. Yes. Another thing I wanted to ask you about is what is prolapse and how can this affect us? Right. So um, a prolapse is when um, one of the walls, possibly the vagina wall, uh, the walls um, has actually... Um, is not strong enough and it has collapsed and it can, can then sort of go into the vagina um, and you get different grades of prolapse. So you get sort of grade one or up to about a grade three or grade four. So depending on the severity, there can be a situation where there is protrudence out of the vaginal opening mm -hmm. um, and it can be a very, very difficult situation for a woman to, to really, um, just deal with on a day-to-day -day basis. Mm -hmm. You know, if you can just, you know, imagine that. So we really want a woman to um, 
try and prevent prolapse, you know, and that way, you know, by, by strengthening their pelvic floor, there's a good chance that they will prevent prolapse because prolapse can, can happen to any woman at any time, whether it's through excessive exercise, whether it's through carrying twins or, you know, multiple births with um, really, um, and it really is very, very debilitating for women to, to, to have a prolapse. And a lot of, lot of people who play sport, you know, um, golfers, you know, they're on their feet a lot. And um, it really is um, something which happens probably more often than we think because we just don't talk about it. But I really just encourage women to, to do your research and educate yourself and make sure that you are, you are doing everything you can to prevent a prolapse. And again, that is often genetic. And it's good to have a chat to your mother and your grandmother and find out if they ever had a prolapse and try and be proactive to make sure that, that you don't um, land up in the same condition. Mm -hmm. Now, how would somebody know if their pelvic floor is weak? What are some of the signs? So um, generally, you would be able to tell that you have a weak pelvic floor because you would be leaking. So um, it's all about incontinence, which we spoke about, or bladder leaks, and, and you get different types of incontinence. So you get stress incontinence, which is really if you cough, you sneeze, or you laugh, or you're exercising, and you leak a little bit. And there are very few women who can actually, postpartum, have a good cough or a sneeze without having to cross their legs for fear of, of leakage. So that's stress incontinence. Um, and of course, the big test too for stress incontinence is jumping on the trampoline with your um, kids because no woman likes to jump on a trampoline because that's really one of the, the, the big tests you, you're most likely um, will leak. Um, and then, of course, you get urge incontinence, which is when you feel like you have to go to the toilet and you have to go now. So there's no um, time to spare. You have to rush to the toilet. And you have to get there as, as quickly as possible. And nine times out of 10, you leak before you get there. Okay. So uh, then, then, of course, you get the next incontinence, which is, a, which is a bit of both. Okay. So it's leaking urine when coughing, sneezing, laughing or running, failing to reach the toilet in time, as you mentioned earlier. Also passing wind um, when bending over or lifting, um, reduced sensation as well, uh, and tampons that, that can dislodge or fall out and also a distinct bulge um, as well in the, the, the vagina's opening. So these are all sort of, uh, I guess, um, signs that you have a, a weak pelvic floor, would you say? Yeah, absolutely. So you also mentioned the, the um, sign of, of a, a bulge, and that would obviously be the first sign to look for for a prolapse. Mm. Um, if, you feel, if you feel uncomfortable, you feel like when you sit down, there's just something's not quite right, you will know that, that, that um, you have a prolapse, and I suggest you go and see um, your gynae or your urologist straight away because um, it, you, it is something which needs to be addressed very, very quickly before it, it weakens and gets worse. Okay, now how is the pelvic floor an important part of our core then as well? So um, because of um, the way we spoke about the muscles in the beginning, how they connect from the pubic bone in the front to the tailbone at the back and from the left to the right, that's quite a large um, suite of muscles. It also connects to our lower back right as well. So um, I find many people who, who do come to our clinic, they they do a lot of gym work and um, they would be um, exercising their glutes, they'd be exercising their core muscles, but until they're able to um, get their pelvic floor muscles into good shape, can they, they then say to me, you know what, for the first time in a long time, I was able to connect my glute muscles to my pelvic floor muscles to my core muscles, it all felt like it connected because our core muscles um, are not um, connected to the, they are not um, we can strengthen the core muscles, we can strengthen our glute muscles, but until we do something about the pelvic floor muscle, we don't have them all connected and all in good shape. Mm -hmm. So how would someone tell if they may sort of get bladder and bowel problems then? Is, is this something that is purely genetic or not? No, I don't know. So there, there are many, many reasons. And um, yes, genetic, as we spoke about, is, is probably a big one, but um, anybody could be susceptible to bladder or bowel problems. Um, we find a lot of men after uh, prostatectomy would have leakage. We find women after um, having childbirth would um, have leakage. We also find that uh, I see a lot of women in the clinic too who say to me, I've never had childbirth. 
how come I'm leaking? But there are other things to consider. If you ever exercise excessively, particularly high impact exercise, that can put your pelvic floor on, under a lot of pressure. If you have a consistent cough and you're always coughing, your pelvic floor is under a lot of pressure. And as, again, as I said, any of the, the um, um, ladies who are nurses and who are teachers who have to go to, to the toilet or have to go um, and, and urinate at a specific time who can't freely just go off to the toilet. They may be in class and they have to hold the urine. So they then put their, um, uh, their bladder under pressure to hold on until such time as, um, you know, the brake bell rings and they can all rush out and go to the toilet. So even though you, you may not have given birth, you can still be susceptible to, um, to urinary incontinence or bladder leakage. In fact, I see a lot of young women who haven't yet given birth and um, I'm noticing more and more in the clinic that anxiety and weak pelvic floor muscles are very, very closely related. And of course, it's a chicken and the egg. Are they anxious because they were leaking or are they leaking because they have anxiety? Yeah. To me, it's very, very closely linked. And speaking about our core also, for a lot of people that sit for great um, lengths of time in, in front of a computer and those types of things as well, would that weaken the core muscles and then potentially also lead to, to a weak pelvic floor or not? Yes, it, it could do because generally you need to be to be um, strengthening your pelvic floor. And of course, we, we spoke about um, Kegels and pelvic floor um, exercises, which are very important. And um, you really do need to be considering the fact that it is a muscle. It's a very important muscle and we should be exercising it to, to keep it in good shape. And a sedentary lifestyle could lead to um, um, problems later on. Um, and also, as we spoke about, was the gravity, you know, being on your feet a lot, um, consistent coughing, et cetera. But once again, it is a muscle that we can strengthen and we can be proactive about these things. So there's always a light at the end of the tunnel, which is great. And, and but so if even if we don't have a genetic history of bladder problems in our family, um, you know, women may still find that they have a weak pelvic floor post-birth. So this is this is really great to understand but what are the options if somebody does have a weak pelvic floor and they do have like a bladder leakage you we, we mentioned at the start of the conversation these are things that you didn't want to um i guess to to, to go ahead head with being surgical um procedures um medication i, I guess there's long-term side effects and they're not always effective um of course there's physio um, and pelvic floor specialists um but so, in some cases i guess with some women, depending on the severity of their pelvic floor strength, um, these types of things may take some time to see some um, results. So I just love to know from your perspective, what are the options if a, um, a woman does have a weak pelvic floor and she has bladder leakage then? So um, Rachel, that's a very good question. So in my case, I, I found, and, and, and you know, I'll share with you my story, I found that I had the start of a prolapse and it was um, the way I, I realized is because I, I've just felt a little bit of discomfort um, in my vagina. I thought that's unusual. And so I went to my GP and, and um, she said to me, it's okay. So you have a minor prolapse. And I said, right, what are my options? How do we sort this? And she said, okay, you can have surgery. And I said, absolutely not. I have read about the Johnson & Johnson class action. I'm, I would not go that route. She said, all right, then you can take medication. I said, no, I'm, I'm not happy with medication. And so she said, right, what about physio? I said, okay, that sounds good to me. I'll do physio for what, about two months? And she said, no, for the rest of your life. And for me, that is not an option because I would like to, you know, you know address the issue and, you know, get it sorted. Now, um, pelvic floor um, physios, um, there are many out there and a lot of them do really, really good work. And it does suit several people. They find that they do get, you know, good traction. But um, in my case, I was just not happy with those options. So I started to, to do a lot of research. And um, I researched the market. And you'll be amazed at how many options there are outside, you know, out there with regards to um, addressing the laxity of um, pelvic floor, the vagina, et cetera, et cetera. And um, after some extensive research, I discovered um, a medical device by BTL called the BTL Encella, which is a totally non-invasive um, 
therapy. Um, it means you don't have to take your clothes off. It is, in fact, a chair. You sit fully clothed and while the high-intensity focus electromagnetic energy um, um, addresses the pelvic floor weakness by giving you contractions, pelvic floor contractions. Um, it sounds scary, but it's not sore at all. Um, and during, we treat people in our clinic on the Encella chair, um, which is six sessions, twice a week for three weeks. Um, during one session, you would sit on the chair, fully clothed for 28 minutes. And during that time, you would get the equivalent of 11,200 pelvic floor contractions. And so after all my research, I had a good look at this. And I then um, found, I contacted BTL Aesthetics um, in Sydney, and they were able to put me in touch with uh, one of the clinics in Melbourne. And I went through the treatment and um, I found post-treatment. The other big thing that, that I found, not only with the, pro, the minor prolapse and the, the leakage, is that I was getting up four times a night to go to the toilet, which as anybody will tell you is just horrific because the next day you just don't have enough energy. You really are very lethargic. And so post-treatment, I was no longer waking up at night and I found that I was not leaking. And so I was that impressed with the machine that I then spoke to BTL um, and then have started um, up my own clinic in Melbourne and I'm using that technology now today. And we treat so many women um, and men too because not only do we treat a urinary incontinence, we also treat erectile dysfunction on that same machine. And so we are really achieving great results and um, it's my passion to, to help women and to educate them because so many women feel like I did when I left my GP's office thinking, I feel helpless. I don't really know what to do. And how do I solve this problem? And when people come to me, they say, I never knew there were alternatives to surgery, medication, and physio. And I'm so glad that I've been able to come through, you know, through your clinic and, and have treatment and address my issues. So, so can um, um, a mother who is, is, is expecting um, and is pregnant go through the treatment as well? Is that something that, or does she have to sort of be sort of post-birth to be able to undergo the treatment? So we do not treat anybody who is pregnant. Mm -hmm. We certainly don't treat anybody who's, who's pregnant. What mm -hmm. we do suggest is that if somebody's thinking of getting pregnant and they know that they're not pregnant, they could get their pelvic floor into good shape by coming through the clinic to have um, the treatment. In fact, we do have some um, IVF doctors who use the Encella chair to treat women before they, they go through the IVF process just to ensure that their pelvic floor is in good shape and in good health before um, IVF treatment. <laughs> but um, back to your question, sorry. So the, um, we do not treat any pregnant woman and we would only treat them six to eight weeks postpartum. Once okay. uh, you know, they've had a time to recover, we would then um, recommend they come thereafter. All right, so it's a sort of pre and post birth then as well, so just to strength. Yes. Okay, wonderful. Yes. So typically the, the chair sort of strengthens the pelvic floor um, via sort of just, is, is it electrodes, did you say? That, that go through no, so it, it is electromagnetic energy. Electromagnetic, so yes. That's right. So it's highly focused electromagnetic energy. And as you sit there, it focuses on your pelvic floor. Mm. You can actually feel the contractions. It, it, it's not sore. It's unusual because not many women or not many people have that, that amount of sensation or activity in that area. So once you get used to it, it's, it's, it's very comfortable. But um, we always, um, we, in our clinic, we actually offer free trials because once people come into the clinic and they then see the technology and they feel it for themselves, they say, absolutely, I can see that this is going to be effective for me. Mm. So is it painless? Is it tre treatment painless overall? We, are, as I said, I've been through the treatment and you do not feel any, um, there's no pain and there's no soreness at all. Um, you do feel a sensation, but it's not uncomfortable. It's just different. This is a very different sensation. But at no stage do you feel any pain. Mm. Now, I understand the treatment is backed by several peer-reviewed, um, published studies as well and clinical trials. It's also won a series of technology awards as well. Is there anything you can tell us about these? So um, 
I really suggest that if any of your um, readers or listeners are interested, that they go to the BTL Aesthetics website mm. um, because there's a lot of good information on there. And if you know anybody from the medical background would like the um, clinical trials, there are available from um, BTL. Um, but um, generally, um, it's good to go onto their website, have a good look. If they're looking for a clinic in their area, obviously I'm in Melbourne, but um, all around Australia, there are clinics that have the Encella chair uh, available. And, um, you know, I suggest they go onto the BTL website mm. and uh, find a clinic close to them and just do their research and um, see if it's something that's suitable for them. Because we are, as I said, we are changing ladies' lives. We are giving them back their freedom and their dignity. And, you know, uh, on our website, we have so many um, testimonials, but it's just so nice when people say to you, you know, I went from four pad changes a day to no pads. Or we recently had a, a, an 81 year old woman who was waking up every hour on the hour and she now wakes up once a night. Wow, um, incredible. We've, we've also had an elderly gentleman who was 81 years old who was waking up many, many times a night and we got him down to one night time wake up or visit to the toilet and his wife was so happy because she, she said that um she was waking up with her husband because she'd have to help him better quality of life him. overall absolutely, absolutely. so it's, it's a, the innovative technology is sounds like it's, it's a great treatment for weakened pelvic floor and as you said it's as the result of childbirth or aging so overall um but it's it's, it's um something that, that as you said irrespective of what state or territory you're in, you can actually find uh, services and clinics around Australia as well. So Yeah, absolutely. And the other thing too, Rachel, is, you know, we, we, we focus on, on, on postpartum mums, but mm. you'll find women, women going through menopause. You know, they, you know there's a whole change in um, the pelvic floor structure too. It gets very dry, the mucus gets very dry, and it's also very good for women, you know, going through peri and postmenopausal um, symptoms too as well well look if this has been a really informative uh, chat today about pelvic floor and once again the importance um, of looking after and strengthening a, a pelvic floor during and after childbirth if you had any key messages for anyone watching and listening what would they be um, so I think um, really from my point of view it is educate yourself get out there um, get onto the internet and find out what your options are don't just um, believe that it is um, normal to leak because as much as it's common, it's not normal. Try and address the issue as early as possible. Don't wait till it's too late, till you, you're 60 or 70 and then you're wearing pads long term. Try and address it when you're a little bit younger and have a chat to your girlfriends because as much as you think you're in it alone, I can guarantee you that at least one out of four or five of your girlfriends is going through exactly the same thing. And um, don't be afraid to do your research and find out what your options are. Don't settle for a life of pads and a life of leakage because we need to um, really um, address the issue. We need to talk about it. It's very taboo subject. Women don't talk about it, yet it is so common, um, but it's not normal. So let's help our girlfriends. Let's help our mothers. Let's, let's just educate them to other options other than a life of pads and yes. a life of leakage. Linda, I've really loved this chat today. If anyone's got any questions for you or want to reach out to you after this interview, whereabouts can they find you? <laughs> right, so um, you just say I'm in Melbourne and I'd be very happy to take any um, queries on my email, which is linda, L-I-N-D-A, at davlinhealth.com.au or you could um, reach me through my website, which is www.davlinhealth.com.au um, or phone me on 0498 111 and I'll be very happy to help you and point you in the right direction, even if you're not in Melbourne or Victoria. Very happy just to help educate women with regards to pelvic floor health. Linda, that's just wonderful. Thanks again for your time. And uh, I will hope for the opportunity to have another chat again in the not too distant future. But in the meantime, just stay safe. Thanks again. Take care. Thanks, Rachel. Thanks so much. Okay, bye. Thanks.